Good evening from our headquarters in Kyiv. This is the Sunday show on Romatsk International, the only prime time TV program explaining the Eastern European geopolitical storm in English. And I'm Natalia Humenyuk. And that's what we have for you tonight. What evidence do Ukrainian authorities have in Babchenko case? Sasha Kolchenko, a Ukrainian illegally convinced in Russia, announced a hunger strike to support Alexei Tsov. We speak with Estonian President Kersti Kalyulet. And we travel to Georgia to see why the Georgians are split between traditional Orthodox values and love for clubbing and techno music. declared dead, then he was declared alive. The story of Russian opposition journalist Arkady Babchenko's assassination sent shockwaves around the world. When the Ukrainian security service revealed that it was, in fact, a sting operation to expose a Russian plot to assassinate Babchenko along with some other people, many signed with the relief. But what was evidence does Ukraine have in Babchenko case, as the story is getting even more odd? An alleged hitman who cooperated with the SBU turned to be a monk, and an army volunteer. A person accused of organizing the plot runs an arms manufacture company, which is under criminal investigation. Moreover, he claimed to work for the Ukrainian counterintelligence. The government denies. But he indeed names his Russian counterpart, whose personality we'll discuss later, while a dozen of Ukrainian journalists confirm to Hromatsky that they've been invited to the security service the reason they might be in the list of 47 potential targets. We have with us Gulliver Craig, the journalist from France 24, and uh, Christopher Miller, who is the correspondent of Radio Liberty here, to discuss the whole story and what new we know. But before, I suggest we watch what Babchenko himself has said, as well, what is the head of the SBU command. While journalists say that I've crossed the line, I'm not a special operations developer. I'm not the one who decided how this will all go. I am not the one who decided how best to do it so as to get the maximum amount of proof, the maximum amount of evidence to catch the person on the spot in the criminal act. The crime is now complete. A person handed over money for the completed crime. He was caught on the spot red-handed. If the SBU thinks that this was the best way for them to gather a base of evidence, Evidence, that means they're right. It's not my business. Does it bother you that this undermines the credibility of journalists in the media? It absolutely bothers me. This is the unpleasant aspect. I had no other choice. My friends, everyone who says that this undermines confidence in the media, what would you have done in my position? You learn there's an order out for your life. Look, here's proof. What do you do next? Have you been involved in any investigations? Could there have been any reason for doing this besides just putting on a show? No, no, no. I'm not investigating anything. I haven't written about anybody in a long time, not about generals or stealing money. That's all clear to me and I'm not interested anymore. I only write, right now, I'm a feuilletonist. What I write generally fits in the category of feuilleton. I was not involved in anything risky. I don't have any business, I don't have any money, I don't even have an apartment. All that I do is write posts on Facebook. From that, the one and only conclusion you can draw is that the motive was related to my public position and my civic activities. Did you have any concerns that the SBU is just making a spectacle? Sure, I had all sorts of concerns and doubts. Nobody showed me an order signed by Putin. When I saw how many people were working on this, sure, you can entertain thoughts that this was all a provocation from the SBU. Why not? Let's assume that in a country at war they've got nothing better to do than douse me in pig's blood. In my opinion, it's more logical to assume the version that it is as is how the SBU says it is. Are you afraid that next time nobody will believe you? My priority was saving my own life and that of my family. Ethical standards of journalism were the last thing on my mind. Forgive me, but let's be honest. You 
Ukraine's security service has established that the preparation for the terror attack against the Russian citizen Babchenko is just one element of the operation carried out by Russian special services aimed at a physical destruction of Russian citizens who, due to their political views, are forced to leave the territory of the Russian Federation for Ukraine and other countries purely because they present an objective image of what's going on in Russia. First of all, this concerns journalists, civil activists, publicists who, as I already mentioned, publicly oppose Russian government. We have documented that in order to realize a cynical plan, Russia hired a Ukrainian citizen. For today, I will only mention the first letter of his second name, it's H. He received a command to find, in exchange for a financial reward, an executor for this audacious murder. In order to carry out this attack given by the Russian special services, Mr. H offered his acquaintance, one of former soldiers in the East, in exchange for 30,000 US dollars to carry out this terror attack, the murder of Russian journalist Arkady Babchenko. Moreover, being the organizer, he personally handed over 15,000 US dollars to the executor up front. Overall, Mr. H received 40,000 US dollars for carrying out this operation from Russian special services, of which 10,000 he kept for himself, being both the mediator and the organizer. We have the information that after carrying out this terror attack, Mr. H planned to leave Ukraine. He already had purchased a ticket, and according to the data we have, he planned to go to Russia via a third country. We would also like to inform that the Russian Special Services also set another task for Mr. H, that is, illegal purchase using the Russian Special Services money, weapons and ammunition in order to create armories in central Ukraine to store them. Just think about it. The order contained 300 Kalashnikov guns, hundreds of kilograms of explosives, unlimited quantities of cartridges, ammunition for grenade launchers, mortar mines, and a lot more. All of this documented within the secret investigative searches. Why did we not tell you last night? Because the investigators and operatives of Ukraine Security Service had done a great load of work today. The investigative and operative actions are still in process. Three hours ago, the organizer of the assassination was detained in Kiev by us. So it's already a couple of days after the... Um we found out that it was a sting operation. Um, so, do you have more evidence? What is the latest? What, are, what is this hardcore data which should uh, make the world believe that it was worthy? Because I understand everybody discussed the trust, the ethical part of it, but what is the evidence? I think it's worth starting by saying it's really a great shame that at the moment Ukraine is coming in for a huge amount of criticism for what it did when we know that since Vladimir Putin has been in power in Russia, a number of journalists have been assassinated. Vladimir Putin and his people have been accused with quite a lot of credibility about a number of terrible crimes. Also, there are 70 Ukrainian political prisoners in Russia at the moment. And it's important to keep things in perspective and not lose sight of the fact that there are good reasons to suspect Russia and to know that Russia is committing a lot of terrible crimes. But the Ukrainians need to realize that this criticism about the way they staged this operation was bound to come because they are simply asserting that they have evidence, which they haven't shown us. The only source for any of what we know about this story, basically, the only source is the SBU, the Ukrainian Security Services, and Arkady Babchenko himself. And we're journalists. We can't, we can't just take their statements as if they were fact, especially considering the reputation that they have, which is not as the most credible of institutions. Chris, do you know that maybe somebody had been shown this evidence? Maybe, I don't know, the ambassadors of the foreign countries. Maybe there are people beside the SBU who have seen something which exactly said that the threat was imminent. There was no other option. Unfortunately, no. Um, no journalist that I know um, has seen um, any, any evidence um, uh, on, on paper, right? There's no hard proof that any journalist has seen. Um, Arkady Babchenko himself, um, I believe, and in his um, uh, first television interview um, uh, after he was resurrected, said that he himself had not seen any evidence that he was simply told by the SBU of the operation. Um, obviously, you know, fearing for his life, he, he partook in it, um, and he said that uh, what they had told him was enough for him to believe it, right? No. So he himself had not seen any evidence. And in the days after, um, he walked into this press conference, and we were all extremely happy to see him uh, very much alive. Uh, no more evidence has come to light. He and say, yeah. just to finish one thought, since you asked about um, uh, uh, Western, Western backers, the ambassadors, uh, following, following that uh, meeting with um, the prosecutors and the SBU, 
um, you know, those folks from Western embassies that I have spoken with said that they did not get any more clarity, that they were simply told um, a little bit more, but that they didn't see or were presented with any more hard evidence uh, backing what the SBU has said um, took place. It's one thing to believe that Arkady Babchenko, who is, after all, an experienced uh, journalist, believed that there was a real threat to his life, was genuinely scared and thought that this, you know, that he'd better go along with what the Ukrainian security services were telling him to do. I mean, imagine yourself in that situation. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of uh, stress. It's a lot of fear. I mean, you don't need to accuse Arkady Babchenko necessarily of uh, doing the wrong thing to want to ask questions. The key question to my mind is, why was this, as they say, the only way to do it? Weren't there other options that could have saved Arkady Babchenko's life without going through this whole masquerade, which does so much damage in so many ways to the credibility of the media, to state institutions? Um, to follow, to follow up on that, um, I, I'm also a correspondent for the Committee to Protect Journalists. And in the hours after Arkady Babchenko turned up alive at this press conference, um, uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists presented a list of questions that they would like to see answered. Among them, um, and perhaps most importantly, was this question to the SBU and general prosecutor um, asking, um, you know, was this really the only option? And if so, can you, you know, can you tell us, can you tell us what other options were considered and, and provide us, um, you know, more substantial uh, proof that this really was the only way? It would make more, the, it would help Ukraine if they could quickly show what is the evidence that they claim to have gathered about this plot. But so far, they haven't really shown anything. They're just asking us to take their word for it and getting more and more angry with the, uh, Ukrainian and foreign journalists, and there are a lot of Ukrainian and foreign journalists who have been criticizing the way that this operation was carried out. And instead of answering the questions that people are um, uh, uh, opposing, people seem to be receiving you know, more and more angry responses from Babchenko himself. I mean, okay, maybe the guy you yeah, know, is, he's gone through a traumatic, but, 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 but also from you know, MPs like Anton Hrashchenko, from, you know, the, the, the Ukrainian authorities all seem to have thought that they would just be applauded for carrying out this amazing operation. And when the reaction hasn't been that, they have basically got angry and, and, talk, and said people are being unpatriotic or people are you know, playing in... You know. And I think that is disappointing considering the, the, the fact uh, that uh, Ukraine uh, is engaged in an information war with Russia and is a victim of, of Russian disinformation. Um, you know, Kiev should um, not, not try you know, uh, to combat Russian disinformation with disinformation of its own. Show us that this is real. We don't, we don't want to see um, uh, you know, this, this kind of uh, operation carried out with no proof, right? Um, uh, I should say that uh, obviously, yes, and the, the answer uh, of the uh, law enforcement is that that was not the fake because the threat was real. But we managed also to talk to the chief of staff of the head of the SBU about whether it was worth it already after the international criticism. The practice that Ukraine's security service used is an international practice. For instance, France in 1982, a similar crime and ordered murder of two political immigrants. In order not to enforce my personal views, I ask everyone to find this story on their own and read about it. See how similar it is to Ukraine's. I want to bring your attention to the fact that similar practices are used by the security services in the United States, the United Kingdom, and also very actively in Russia. We did not think about the theatrical effect when we planned this operation. I want to bring your attention to Arkady's words, his emotions. He said that the SBU employees put their noses to the grindstone. This is his independent assessment of the SBU's work. With regards to his appearance yesterday, I don't think there was anything theatrical about it. Yes, there was a shock factor about it. We don't hide that this was part of our operation, but this was directed first and foremost at the employees of our opponents, the employees of Russia's security service. And this shock was also intended for receiving a more emotional reaction, which we did. The Foreign Minister of Ukraine, Pavlo Klimkin, speaking before the United Nations Security Council Committee, called for the world to help investigate this murder. And now it turns out that we lied to the entire world. By we, I mean Ukraine as a state. Did you predict such a reaction from our foreign partners? Will they still believe us as a state later? Look, coming back to 1982, I want to remind you that after the operation by French Special Services, 
the President of France gave a public speech and even cancelled his visit to Romania. This is just an analogy we can draw. With regards to the actions of Ukraine's security service, we base them exclusively on Ukraine's law and its criminal procedure code. What the security service did does not go beyond the legal framework. Our task was to do this in secret from the people who ordered the assassination, from the representatives of Russia's security services. We wanted to show the world to what extent Russia uses hybrid terrorism methods in Ukraine. So now let's put these two things on balanced scales. On one side, the sole statement from Klimkin, and on the other side, the demonstrative picture of the cynical provocation to kill not only citizens of your own country, but also the citizens of another country on foreign soil. In my opinion, the side that has this illustrative image will win by far. Why was staging a murder necessary? Why not just pretend that he was wounded and hide him in hospital? This would have created less drama about it. You know, you're trying to ask me the same thing that FSB wants to have answers to. I will not answer this for now. Let's wait a couple of days and wait for these materials that I mentioned earlier, perhaps not in a lot of detail. But trust me, they will give people things to think about. Yes, uh, they did it the way that they did it in order to have the shock factor, in order to maximize the emotional impact. That sounds to me like an admission that it was not the only way, but that they thought that it would be the best way to, have, to attract the most attention and to have the biggest um, shock factor. I mean, that shows that they really grossly underestimated the negative aspects, the bad um, effect that what they were doing would have on the general situation in this information war that they're in with Russia. Do they forget that Russia constantly claims that the British faked the poisoning of Sergei Skripal in March and his daughter. Now, the fact that Ukraine has basically done some kind of a fake operation like this one is, just gives credence to all those people who believe those kinds of theories. That's just one of the various aspects in which this was a hugely risky thing to do, which undermines trust. And they just didn't seem to... It just seems to me, from the way that he admitted just then that they wanted to increase the shock factor, shows that they just they didn't think about what the information effects would be of it. Chris, um, what would you say to those uh, who claim that, you know, uh, Ukraine should be understood? It's a country at war, the emotion is on the rise, and, uh, you know, there could be, and you know that somehow Ukraine is always uh, expected to uh, live according to the highest standard, but that's not exactly possible in the real world. Mm -hmm. Well, Ukraine sees itself as being pro-European. It sees itself as moving away from Russia, and it certainly has uh, aspirations to become a part of the European Union. Um, you know, the way that Western democracies behave is not, uh, I, I think, exactly how um, Ukrainian officials behaved at this press conference, right? And the, what, what they have presented is, is not um, that of a European democratic society. Um, the, the SBU had very little credibility uh, to begin with, um, if, if, if you ask me, um, and, and several other journalists will, will, will say the same thing, um, which I, I think makes it all the more important to present as much hard evidence as possible when conducting an operation such as this one. But Ukraine should wear it as a badge of honor that Ukraine is not judged in the same way that Russia is, that people expect better of Ukraine, you know? This should, this should be something that Ukrainians should be proud of and not complaining about. So the emotions are really uh, on the rise, uh, but um, I also would like us to, and that's what we're trying to do, to go after the facts about what we know exactly about the people named. So we have prepared a couple of the reports of about, uh, on the hitman, on the alleged organizing and the Russian contact. So the first person I would like you to um, learn who is him is the Oleksiy Tsimbaluk, Aka Aristark, who is the uh, military volunteer a monk who went to SBU, who was asked to commit this crime, but went to cooperate with FBU. It happened that Hromatsky had made a report about him a year and a half ago.
Чого прийшов до нас ворог на землю? Він все видомо нещасливий. Значить, йому треба прийти до когось і забирати чуже. Раз воно нещасливе, раз воно мучиться, не живе, то відібрати в нього життя, то не є гріхом, то є просто ну, актом милосердя до нього. Просто треба все робити з любов'ю. Ну і що, є гріх, вбивство, да? а є позбавлення життя. Я ж тепер останнішся один. От такого, як ти, позбавити життя не є гріх. Ну, хорошо. І от коли Каїн позбавив життя Авеля, Господь на нього положив свою печать. Оце твоя печать зараз. So uh, the guy we've just watched, Oleksiy Tsimbaluk, said that he was asked to do and commit this murder, but the guy, but another person whom he knew, uh, and this person is Boris Herman. He is currently in the court. Our correspondent are spending time there, and he is a businessman and a founder of Schmeisse Company, which is not a German but a Ukrainian company, uh, which is uh, connected to the arm manufacture. And this guy, Boris Herman new Tsimbaluk since 2009 because they have summer houses nearby. And uh, let's watch the comment of Mr. Herman. I work with these intelligence services. I've been working with them for a fairly long time, around half a year. It so happened that a friend of mine from long ago who is currently living in Moscow had been in the employ of Putin, specifically in an organization dedicated to discord in Ukraine. This fact was reported to the leadership of internal intelligence and counterintelligence. I personally think that this counterintelligence should be working, not the SBU. Counterintelligence gave me the opportunity to investigate their connections, understand the flow of cash which comes into Ukraine, through whom and to whom, what political parties and personalities, and to what extent these groups are terroristic. Which territories are they financed by, how are weapons stocked, and what are their general plans? I don't have any negative feelings towards Babchenko, and I don't have any issues with Tsimbaluk. Tsimbaluk was chosen for this mission by counterintelligence because he is known for his activities in the ATO. He's a priest and would never kill a person, especially one who is unarmed. When he was chosen for this role, everyone knew that he would run to the SBU and tell them what happened. We knew that the murder would be staged, everything was clear, but it was only to get information from a Russian source, so we had to create the illusion of work in order to gain their trust. After this, we received a list of 30 people who they wanted to assassinate on Ukrainian territory, which was also given to counterintelligence. And finally, the Russian connection. So Herman named his contact in Moscow, which in the Putin fund. It was the longtime acquaintance Vyacheslav Pivavarnik. A person with the same name and surname is also a partner in Herman's company, Kiev Consulting Group. According to the EU control system, Vyacheslav Alexandrovich Pivavarnik owns 11% of the company, is, which is registered in the kitty city of Chop in Western Ukraine. Pivovarnik is a co-owner or manager of at least five legal entities in Ukraine, including the logistic company and Ruskon Ukraine, the daughter company of the Russian container operator Ruskon. He also co-owns the Kiev-based company Public Security Service of Ukraine with Serhii Yeryomovich Deyev. A person with the same name has been featured in the media as an activist for Ukrainian old believers and an expert of the Russian Foundation for National and International Security. So here we see the Odnoklasniki profile of the person with the same name. And uh, what is important to mention that he has as the friend uh, Boris uh, Herman. So they are connected, obviously, and he's considered to be based in St. Petersburg. Does it help us? And just to everything this complex, I'll try to simplify again for our audience. So. The organizers named the Russian contact. We just talked to him. This guy exactly has some connection to the dodgy fund uh, with the Russian believers. At the same time, this guy claimed he works for the Ukrainian counterintelligence and he indeed knows the hitman who is named by the prosecutors. And he asked this hitman, as he says, uh, to 
commit this possible crime knowing that this guy, a monk, is a patriot, so he yeah. won't do that. That's, we were just saying when we were watching this that this story that Boris uh, Herman is presenting does seem very clever, but there's even less reason to believe him than uh, yeah. any of the other players in this, to be honest. I mean, let's just make that clear that there's not... We haven't got any thing to go on other than his word that this crazy story that he was actually working for counterintelligence is true. So it may well be that him and his lawyers just dreamed it up in order to have some kind of defence. But the whole thing does seem, I mean, like it's almost... I, it's, it's, it's surreal. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, would, I would challenge a, a crime writer to write, to write this book and, um, and, uh, and, have it, and have it sell. But look, I mean, I think, I think in the days after, after um, the, you know, these, these events took place, the whole story has only become more convoluted. And there, are, everything. These these two guys, um, uh, Zimbaluk and uh, Herman, uh, and, and the situation around them, I'm afraid, just raises even more questions and provides us even fewer answers. And in you know, in this as well, they are apparently asserting that there is a list of 47 people that uh, the Russians wanted to target. And they say that they've put all of these people under protection. Well, have they really put all of these people under the protection that's necessary? If they felt that the only way to protect Arkady Babchenko was to fake his death, then why, how can we be, feel assured that these 47 people, if the list which the SBU says exists really does, are really safe? Also, that list jumped from 30 people to 47 people, I believe, overnight. Well, they say and that's because it's more information. No, but that's, they say that's because of, of more information that they found after having arrested uh, this uh, Mr. Hunt. Um, and um, mm -hmm. so they, but if there they're is, clear about that. If there is a credible mm -hmm. threat to these people's lives, to 47 mm -hmm. people, and I think Detector Media published um, the story of one Lviv journalist um, who said that he had received a call from the SBU uh, around the same time that all of the other people um, who received calls and had gone to the SBU confirmed that they were, ca they were called and brought in to be made aware of uh, a threat to their life. Well, this journalist from Lviv said the SBU had called him and said, we'd like you to come in um, in the next 45 minutes. Now, Lviv is obviously a four or five hour ride away from there, and he wasn't able to come in. When he asked why, they wouldn't, they w they, they wouldn't tell him, and they, never, they still haven't, as far as I, I know, provided him with any more information. If there's a credible threat to his life, don't you think that somebody in the regional SBU would go to this person and uh, let him know that there, that there is such a threat to his life? If it's uh, that important, and if it is, in fact... True. To elaborate more on that story, so what uh, the general prosecutor Lutsenko said, that there are 17 people identified to whom the calls were given. So it's indeed on Friday there were a group of journalists, at least dozen, we talked to them. We called to almost each of them and many, many others who hadn't been asked. Uh, so they went to the security service, but they signed a letter that they are not allowed to say anything. All of them mm. had signed. Some people didn't have, who got the received the calls, uh, didn't have the chance to come. Uh, for instance, they were somewhere very far away. Uh, so there are no details, but indeed it creates a pretty strange atmosphere because you don't know what's happening. You know, you have a dozen of people who signed. Uh, they, have, they have the right. Two, they have the two right. journalists two who worked for forward. Petro Poroshenko's mm -hmm. channel did come out and say publicly that they had been informed that the they Russian were on the target list. Yeah. yeah. One Ukrainian, one Russian. No? Uh, uh, Evgeny oh. Kisilov and, and Matvey Ganapolsky, uh, but there are more. Mm. Uh, so we also consider we don't publish this list. We have it, you know, because it's still not clear whether they just called to the SBU or are they really the targets. Uh, that's a tricky situation. But really, generally, what you know, there was the, one of the criticism was that there are a number of cases, like cases of the Sherry Met uh, and the others, they were not investigated recently, and not just of the journalists, but other Russian citizens who've been killed uh, within the last couple of years. That is one of the reasons why the SBU and the Ukrainian authorities have a very, very low credibility rating, and it's something that they should have taken in had in mind, I think, uh, when they were planning this, they might have asked themselves the question, are people going to believe us? If you remember, on the 5th of December, Yuri Lutsenko published audio recordings that purported to show Mikhail Saakashvili, who was then a Ukrainian opposition politician, plotting with members of the former president, Viktor Yanukovych's uh, clan, to uh, cause uh, disturbances uh, and uh, take power in Ukraine. Basically, accusations of high treason. If that was true, if those were real, they would have put him on trial in Ukraine, wouldn't they? They didn't. They just whisked him off to Poland. And so that's what, another reason why you know, people don't believe that, that your first ref reflex when you see Yuri Litsenko appear 
unfortunately, maybe he's telling the truth. But your first reflex when you see this man is, oh, that's the man who lied about this. That's the man who lied about that. This is not a person in whom we can have confidence. In that way, he's different from the general prosecutor of, of, of other countries, you know. And uh, to finalise our discussion, Chris, for instance, what would be the evidence or something which is needed for you as a journalist to be persuaded? What else, in particular in this whole complex situation, would other moves you uh, would accept and expect? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we, they, the, the authorities can start by answering several questions. Um, as I mentioned, the CPJ had posed several of them, including um, what other uh, ways of conducting this investigation were considered before going to such an extreme as faking the death of a journalist and possibly undermining their credibility and uh, then the credibility of all of us journalists who reported on this. Um, you know, they can, they can show us this list. They can explain um, how, you know, how the operation unfolded from day one, um, who was approached, who was involved, um, how many people within the Ukrainian government will, were involved. Um, you know, they can better show the direct ties to the security services of Russia, um, who they say are behind this and, and masterminding it, right? If they're so certain that Russia's behind it, um, don't tell us, show us. Right? They need to be held to a very high standard. I don't think it's, it's enough for, for, for a country that is at war, that is um, the victim of disinformation, and uh, you know, to, to just simply say. I think, I think they should not, not you know, play, play in, in, this, in this Russian game. They should, they should rise above that. They should provide us proof to show us that this has happened. Thanks a lot for the discussion and I encourage uh, everybody to stay with Hromadske International with this story. I know the, uh, there are a lot of debates but we're trying to follow the facts. So I also suggest that uh, you go to our webpage and .hromadske.ua. There are numbers of articles about the alleged, alleged organizers, uh, the Russian connections, connectors. So that's you can do. Uh, but also for the final of this segment, we have a very short... Uh, uh, interview or just a comment from the director of the um, arm manufacturer company Schmeiser, uh, who used to work with the suspected organizer. The fact that he was detained remains. Not believing he was detained would be stupid. Everybody saw and heard him in court. What about the suspicion? I can't say anything. I'm not a spy. I didn't work for the SBU, so I won't comment on anything. This was just as unexpected, and we went through the same sort of shock. Another political prisoner from Crimea held in Russia, 28 years old Sasha Kolchenko, has declared a hunger strike. His demand is to free Alexinsov. Meanwhile, Alexinsov has been on hunger strike for three weeks already. Sinsov condition for the end of the strike is the release of political prisoners held in Russia, out of 64 who are detained in connection to the political charges related to Crimea annexation, 27 are kept on Russian soil. Kolchenko is a left-wing ecological activist sentenced to 10 years and accused of cooperating with Ukrainian far-right groups in a fabricated case. Kolchenko's mother, who lives in annexed Crimea and considers herself a political, stands by the decision of her son. Earlier, I visited Larisa Kolchenko and talked to her about circumstances Sasha is being kept in. You're um, currently watching the, uh, used to watch the protests which are happening in Kiev, uh, but before I'd like to uh, propose you to, in, to watch the interview of Larissa Konch Kolchenko uh, and how he, she managed to visit her son for three times during the last four years. Larissa, you went to the colony in Kapesk. Tell us about it. The first time I was very afraid of this meeting. I hadn't seen him for a year and a half before this meeting. I was afraid the prison would change him, but when I met him, I saw my son Sasha. He hadn't become resentful. He's as positive as he was before everything had happened. What did your son tell about the colony? He's reluctant to speak about the colony. He tends to ask more about what's happening in Crimea, in Ukraine, about friends. He's very interested in what's happening around the world. He tries not to talk about the colony. He just says, Mom, everything's fine. 
What does Sasha talk about? Do they feed them in the colony? Does he walk there? Who does he spend time with? He reads most of the time. He's now learning English in the colony. Sometimes he goes to the gym. He wants to get a job to learn some kind of specialty so that time goes faster, but they denied him those opportunities. They said that they don't need someone with the kind of criminal articles that he's been charged with. What are you hoping for, for an exchange? Of course we're hoping for an exchange. Sasha also has faith in Ukraine, that they won't leave him, that they will exchange him. He's an optimist in life. His spirits haven't fallen and he is hopeful. Back in Rostov, you gave him the books of the Ukrainian writer Ivan Franko, as I understand. What kind of books did he ask you? I gave him Ivan Franko then. The guys collected a three-volume book in Simferopol and he carried all these books with him wherever he went, to Rostov and Chelyabinsk. But in Chelyabinsk he was forced to put these books into storage because Ukraine literature is not allowed there. But he does bring everything with him. It's hard there, of course. What did Sasha love about Crimea? What did he enjoy doing there? He loved Crimea very much. He liked to go hiking, traveling. He practically walked the whole of Crimea. He was studying at the Taurida National University. He finished two years of university before all this happened. He chose to study tourism, which is part of the geography faculty. He had actually been reinstated at the Kyiv University to continue his education long distance, but they won't allow him to do this. We're trying to push for the authorities to allow him to continue his studies, but I don't know how it will turn out. I think that unfortunately I will eventually have to leave Crimea. I've lived there all my life. Of course, it will be very difficult, but I understand Sasha will never return to Crimea. Back then, in 2014, how did you find out that Sasha was detained? Were you keeping an eye on the situation in Crimea? What did Sasha tell you when he was captured? Sasha was detained on May 16th in the center of the city. He was walking down the street with his friends and was detained by FSB officers. On the same day, our house was searched. He was first charged with involvement in mass riots and then it snowballed and it turned into terrorism charges. Did Sasha say anything about Alec? He didn't say much because they... All of the people involved in this case weren't really friends. I generally wonder how they tied everything together, because they crossed paths during the meetings that took place in 2014, but they weren't really familiar with each other. They weren't close friends. While Alek Sensov, who is kept in Yamal, which is the Russian Arctic, conditions is deteriorating. His lawyer, as well as everybody who knows the filmmaker, confirms that he is the person who won't change his mind. That is how it feels after talking to his mother, Lyudmila Sensova, who is raising Alek's kids, including the younger, who has autism. Watch our interview. Tell us about your life. How are Alex's children? Tell us about them. I want to say that the children are very brave. The first year and the second year even were very difficult for Alina. She argued with teachers and with other people. But now she's very wise. She has set a goal for herself to get an education. So she's studying. Tell us about them. She's exactly like Oleg. There were many questions about Oleg, and then her teacher said, Alina, it's difficult for you here. You just need to change schools. And then she said, Grandma, I listened and listened at first, and I wanted to run away from there. And then the teacher told her to change schools. So she turned around and said, I studied here before, I'm studying here now, and I'm going to continue to study at this school. If you don't like it, you leave. She was in the fifth grade. Then she turned around and walked away. 
How close was he with his children? How did he raise them? He loved them very much. He took them everywhere, to the mountains, to the beach. He was always with them. If he calls or writes, Alina and him still discuss which books to read. To this day, she still listens to him very much. It was very difficult for Vlad. He didn't call him dad, he called him Oleg. Oleg was everything to him, and then suddenly he was gone. Vlad had very big eyes. He looks at you with these big eyes and asks, where is Oleg? Where did he go? Is it my fault that he left? How often do you write to Oleg? We try to write to Oleg often. Of course, we rarely receive letters from him. Maybe once every one and a half months or once a month. But we write him. I write maybe four letters a month. I just write about the children, what they're doing, where they've been, how their studies are going. I don't write about anything else. Of course, we don't write about our problems. Everything is always going well for us. The children are good. All is well. How does he sound? What was his voice like? I cried so much when he was transferred there. I did not know that he was in the detention facility or whatever it's called. There was just nothing, no letters, no phone calls. I didn't know where he was or what he was doing. And then he called. I cried nonstop for a week maybe because his voice was like that of a person who was being destroyed. It was terrible. Then a letter arrived, and he wrote that everything was fine. During the next phone call, he was happy. He had received a photo of the children. Of course, he hadn't seen them for a long time. He had been sent photos before, but there was a year and a half difference, and in that time they had grown up. He was very happy with these photos. His voice was chipper, and that meant he wasn't sick, and everything was more or less fine there. But at first, it was very scary. What does he say about conditions he is held in? He never says anything. He says, I'm fine. I say, Oleg, do you need anything? I have everything I need, Mom, he says. He doesn't want to meet. No, he doesn't. He says it won't bring anyone joy. Not us, not him. It will only make things harder. We wanted to come to Rostov. I said, I'll come with the children. Rostov wasn't that far away. But he said, don't. I've seen people who have been visited by their children and what happens to them later. For me, Ural is very far away. I have no idea how to get there. Alina and I looked at the map, but that's just a map. I can only imagine how long it took him to get there and in what condition he got there. My eyesight is poor now and it's difficult for me to get there myself. I really want to see him. It's frightening to think that it's possible I may never see him again. Do you speak with Sasha Kolchenko's mother? I don't talk with anyone. Is it hard? It's hard, especially because he's so young. I tear up when I think about it. If I see his mother, I might faint. It's very difficult for me. I will never approach her leg about what happened. This is his life. He was already 40 years old. It was his choice. Kolchenko is younger. I feel more sorry for him, because he's a young boy. What would you want to say to Alec? We love you very much, son, and we're waiting for you. I want him to get out and be with the children again. Vlad needs a father. He's a sick boy. He needs development. He's not stupid. He reads wonderfully. I'm afraid that this is how the years will pass. People will forget about him and he will be in prison for 20 years. We've just noted some minutes ago that the mother of Oleg Kolchenko and mother of Alexander Sa- Sasha Kolchenko and uh, Alex Sinsov has just met for the first time and uh, they made a common appeal to the president of Ukraine, Poroshenko, to do anything possible to save their kids, as also from our own sources. Uh, 
we in, in Russia while we're talking, we know that there is nobody else to approach but the Russian president Vladimir Putin himself. But also we should say that earlier Hromatsky traveled to the places where Kolchinka and Sinsov are held. So we encourage you to watch our documentary named From Crimea to Siberia. It's available on Hromatsky International YouTube channel and web page special project section. Also, uh, to remind you that the full version of all, all our reports and the interviews are available there. Also, sign up for our newsletter if you would like to receive Hromatsky International's weekly highlights. The sign-up box is on the upper right-hand side of the web page. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook, search Hromatsky International, and I'll be back in a second. The Estonian president, Kersti Kaljulid, has become the first head of the foreign state to visit conflict-affected region in the Ukrainian Donbass. The Estonian leader traveled to the city of Kramatorsk, where she met with the internally displaced people during her trip to Ukraine, which kicked off on May 22. Obviously, Russian-Ukrainian war was one of the key topics on her agenda. The Baltic country itself declares its need to defend itself from the Kremlin, as Estonia was the first state to experience a Russian cyber attack back in 2007. But it's important to mention that the Estonian president insists countries should not use counter-propaganda in the war against the truth. Here is our exclusive interview. I can see that Ukraine has made uh, great steps in uh, changing its uh, society. Uh, well, it is attempting to do uh, steps to change its uh, economic climate for the better, so that uh, it will be an uh, even playground for all businesses. Uh, I could see that particularly uh, in the east of the country, uh, politicians are thinking how to support SME development. Uh, so all this part looks quite hopeful. On the other hand, we know that uh, there has been some stalemate in creation of the uh, anti-corruption court uh, and uh, there is a problem of uh, internally displaced people, uh, etc. So we have quite a high number of challenges and the highest among these challenges obviously is the low intensity war which is going on in uh, eastern Ukraine. You are well known for your active work with the civil society, with the representatives of the uh, civil sector. What you can advise for Ukrainian authorities how to go through this barrier between the society and government? Uh, you just must accept that uh, civil society and voluntary uh, action normally is directed at the points which hurt the society most and uh, which definitely need quick uh, attention from politicians. And if you accept that, then you realize that uh, cooperation with uh, non-governmental organizations and uh, voluntary groups takes your uh, state forward really quickly. In Estonia, we use this as a model of 21st century public management that uh, we actually actively seek to create services which are supported uh, both by the government, local government and uh, NGOs. And we have noticed that uh, over the years, NGOs have uh, amassed a huge amount of uh, information and methods, for example, to forward uh, social policies in the country. They are really good think tanks. So supporting them seems uh, simply more reasonable to develop your uh, societies. And it's also guaranteeing you that you are working with issues which matter because I've not yet seen a voluntary action which deals with matters which are not important for society. And uh, your activity list renews itself constantly, because if civil society loses interest, probably the problem has been solved, gone away, and you can move onwards, which is very different to the traditional public sector services creation, where you, for five years, think what to, what to provide and then provide a uniform service to everybody. This is too costly and too slow for people to get what they really need. And that's why we operate with NGOs. They pinpoint uh, the painful points in the society. And how can you evaluate this work in Ukraine? I know you have met with some representatives of public sector. What did they say? How you, what do you think? About I have that? to say that they were very optimistic about particular reforms, healthcare, decentralization. Uh, and they see, of course, where uh, you should go further. Like they were very worried uh, about uh, 
the inactivity about uh, declarations of economic interest, uh, for example. They were very worried about the uh, creation of the anti-corruption court. So they pinpoint exactly on the uh, issues in the society which are painful. They apply pressure there and a clever politician, of course, works with them and uh, hears this signal. And I could also see that uh, they have uh, clearly been heard in uh, this society. They were not ho at all hopeless. They were quite hopeful, I have to say, about Ukrainian development. Another thing, unfortunately, sometimes Ukrainian-Estonian relationships are remembered in the context of the investment scandals, for example, in Kyiv's Sky Mall and in Odessa's Zatoka, where, as many say, local mafia just tried to seize the money from the investor. Have you raised this issue with the talks with the Poroshenko? And what can you say? Will Estonia continue to invest in Ukraine after all? First of all, Estonia does not invest in Ukraine. It's Estonian businesses who decide uh, where to invest. And of course, I would, I would be very astonished if somebody right now started a big real estate investment project from Estonia. So these old issues need to be sorted out. And I'm quite optimistic that uh, as Ukraine develops as rule of law, uh, these uh, cases will be sorted out. Definitely, they are very visible in Estonia, and I've heard that also uh, companies from other countries are facing uh, similar difficulties. So indeed, you need to develop your economic climate in general and your rule of law, rule of law state in general, but people will look at the particularities and concrete cases. If they are solved, I'm quite sure that this will unleash uh, a new wave of uh, interest in Ukraine. Meanwhile, I'm afraid that... Uh, our companies are still very interested, but I see that most of this interest is in trade, where the loss of heavy investment uh, uh, risk is, uh, this risk is much lower. You were an economics advisor to the Prime Minister in the time when the Estonia started to introduce the electronic governance system. Ukraine is trying to do so, and after the meeting, President Poroshenko said that Ukraine and Estonia will do this thing in Ukraine. So what were the hardships, what uh, Ukraine should do to make this efficient? First of all, you cannot compare development of digital state to another state because every state is a culture anyway, and your state culture will prevail also in your digital state. So everybody must find their own ways. Also, you cannot compare digital of the beginning of the century to the digital of today. Uh, the risks are different, the opportunities and possibilities nowadays are much better. So you shouldn't be looking what we have been doing, but you should be looking what are our objectives of service provision and use the most modern technology you can afford to use. It doesn't probably need to be very cutting edge, but it definitely wouldn't be exactly the same as we did, because time has gone by. And uh, what you need is uh, just the will. And I can see here is uh, clearly the will. In the middle of May, Georgian police had carried out raids in some of Tbilisi's biggest nightclubs, with several people suspected of disturbing drugs arrested as a result. That same night, on May 12th, young Georgians came out in protest in demonstration which lasted for a couple of days. This protest in turn caused resentment among local nationalist organizations who took to the streets for a counter-protest. Hermanski traveled to Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, to speak with representatives of those split between traditional orthodox values and love for clubbing and techno music and enjoy this report. This week, I believe 15,000 people came for our rally. This was the largest rally we've ever had. Usually we stage a large demonstration so that we are visible. But since this was spontaneous, we were just standing on this ladder. David Subiliani is one of the leaders of the Georgian white noise movement 
which has been pushing the decriminalization for various drugs since 2015. It was White Noise, which had been organizing protests meetings in Tbilisi, although the question of drug policies hasn't been coming up to these days. The night of May 12th, Georgian police conducted a set of raids against popular nightclubs in Tbilisi. They arrested several people on the charges of drug trafficking. These raids were considered to have been highly aggressive. After the raids, nightclub attendees had gone onto the streets to protest. On the 12th of May, outside of the Georgian parliament, they demanded the resignation of the Prime Minister and Minister of Internal Affairs. The protest itself resembled a rave, with people listening to loud music and dancing. People were dancing and some had been there at that moment, including my sister. After that, there was huge criticism as to how someone can dance near a memorial. The argument was that dancing is not wrong and that it's a normal and a positive thing. The people who died here and to whom the monument is dedicated also danced and sang until soldiers came with guns and so on. Dances near the monument, which was put up in memory of the dead at a time when the 1989 rallies were being disbanded, were perceived to be blasphemous by nationalist and far-right organizations. They also accused the dancing protesters of drug propaganda. Fearing clashes with these radical groups, protesters decided to suspend their actions. Thus, Georgia was split into two camps. This is a celebration of the holiness of the family event. We just want to give everyone love, and that's all, nothing else. The Day of the Holiness of the Family is a relatively recent holiday in Georgia. It was declared in 2014 by the Georgian Orthodox Patriarch Ilya II. The rest of the world marks this as a day of anti-homophobia. Orthodox Georgians annually attend the march. Representatives of the LGBT community try not to hold any meetings on this day in order to not provoke any conflict. This year, many celebrating the holiday criticized the dance protests. Excuse me, please. Those weren't people there. They were only gays. I'll say it up front. Gay is a weak word. There were faggots standing over there. I hate them. Those weren't people. A bunch of spoiled youths were there. On the evening of May 18th, LGBT organizers gathered near the state chancellery in the center of Tbilisi. Those gatherings in Georgia are protected. Cordons of guards closed all entrances into the building. I want to live freely, calmly, to be like everyone else. I'm not a lesbian, I'm simply a person, I'm for freedom. Homophobia is actually blooming on the streets. I have repeatedly been a victim of homophobia, as well as my 19-year-old son, just because he has long hair. For some reason, he's included. Someone didn't like that. There are many of these people. We haven't done anything wrong to anyone. I'm also here because I don't want fascists to be able to calmly congregate in my country. We defeated fascism once already. Their time is over. This is the 21st century, people. Near the parliament, 500 meters away, there was a meeting of anti-LGBT activists. Many of them hold far-right views. They stood there till the late evening, even when the anti-homophobia protesters had driven away on the bus. On the 17th of May, Georgian Orthodox Patriarch Ilya II declared it the day of the family. Sexual minorities, representatives of the LGBT community, decide to do stage protests on this day each year. There was a request today for this demonstration not to take place, and they had promised it won't be held. They even announced it on television. But in reality, we looked away for one second and they appeared, closed off and protected by police, hiding from us. This meeting here is a rally against them. Excuse me for being so blunt, but we hate faggots and lesbians. We are Georgians, real Georgians, and we love our country. Georgians live here. What sort of Georgians are they? Don't they have any faith? No, they have no faith. David Sibiliani says that the dance protests included many members of the LGBT community. Anna and Katie, who came for the anti-homophobia meeting, also protested on the 12th of May. They say they came out for freedom for all. For some reason they thought that we were defending people who were selling drugs. We're just defending our freedom. We want to live calmly, to work and to live our lives. I genuinely don't get it. Some people like to drink. I like LSD. What's the issue? I'm not doing anything bad to anyone. Drugs serve as another stumbling block within Georgian society. Towards the end of 2015, there was a general decision of the Constitutional Court that if someone has at least 70 grams of marijuana, they can imprison them. 
The goal of white noise is full decriminalization of all drugs in Georgia. In 2017, Parliament even considered such a bill. It was important for us to work on the entire drug policy. We couldn't focus solely on marijuana or light drugs, as they are called, which are used by clubbers and ravers. This is because people who use harder drugs are in a worse state. This isn't just a question of rights for them, but a question of health as well. If the principle changes, then it should change for everything. We wrote a bill proposal which closely resembles the system that was put in place in Portugal. But the policy proposal hasn't been even looked at. David Bitterly states that the deputies deceived him while the nationalist organizations have launched a campaign against white noise and its supporters. We said that we can put in decriminalization just like many countries in Europe and in the world generally have done. Our opponents started saying that this isn't a movement for users but for sellers, for drug dealers, they say. The first two years of our work had nothing to do with that. When everything was reaching the moment when a decision had to be made, they began to worsen our chances with such company. Even to this day, when we gather here, these same people come and say that these are drug dealers and traffickers. The conservatives in Georgia responded very negatively to the idea of liberalizing drug laws. In liberalizing and decriminalizing things, they want drugs as well. This is a horror. How can the government consider this acceptable? This is a sickness, a loss of character. How can the government lose its character? I don't know, they want some kind of legalization in place, but we consider it illegal, we are against it. And why are you against it? Because we are orthodox, we need dignity, family dignity. On the 19th of May, the dance protest was supposed to resume, but they had decided to cancel it. David Sibiliani stated that the protesters are seeking new outlets to reach to the government. Georgian journalist Dmitry Avliani is sure, after all this, its far-right organizations had a role in putting an end to the dance protest, a dangerous precedent had been set. The protest didn't take place because there were threats by some far-right groups, and this will continue to go on. Those far-right groups understood that they have the power to influence the position of the other side, to the position of the state, and they will continue doing so because they know they can. You need to understand that a very bad precedent has been set, that people who gathered with legitimate grievances, fully, legally, having broken no laws, peacefully were told that their activism wasn't acceptable. The way they look is unacceptable, the way they dance, and so on. And for that response, they have to leave. The days when there are no protests or meetings, everything is calm in Georgia. White Noise is saying that there will be no protests in the coming weeks. David Sibiliani is sure that there is no unsolvable of schism in the Georgian society yet. As such, there is still a chance to find common ground. With that, I thank you from the entire team of Romatsky International for watching and say you goodbye. Доповідаю, ні. За два з половиною роки останніх таких операцій було 31. Але найцікавіше, що Воскресіння спробував зіпсувати і сам генпрокурор. Він використав цю нагоду для зведення політичних рахунків і спробував прикрити успішною операцією всі минулі провали, за які у нас, власне, і критикують правоохоронні органи. Дозволю собі звернутися до всіх цих діячів з пропозицією. У всіх тисячах постів на Фейсбук, у всіх сотнях заяв в інших засобах масової інформації спростувати весь той бруд і всю ту брехню, яка була винити за цю неповну добу на правоохоронну систему України.
Критикуй тих, хто критикує. Ось найпростіший спосіб вирішити існуючі проблеми правоохоронної системи. Після перших повідомлень про нібито вбивство Бабченка знайшлося, що сказати і у сивочолих політичних трупів, шансів на воскресіння, у яких, на щастя, майже немає. Вбивства людей, в тому числі в Києві і в інших містах України, перетворились на буденне явище. А якщо трішки подумати? То це могло бути приурочено до е, перебування в Україні президента Німеччини. І ще трішечки. Незабаром розпочнеться чемпіонат світу, щоб цей захід зірвати. Ну, ще трошки подумайте. Подумали? Кажіть. Для того, щоб змінити політичні, власне, розклади в Україні. Як бачите, Володимир Литвин готовий згенерувати цілу Вікіпедію версій будь-якої події, тільки б про нього не забули у телевізорі. До речі, про тих, кого все ж таки у цій історії забули. Володимир Гройсман був чи не єдиним з перших осіб держави, хто відреагував на своїй сторінці у Фейсбуці на вбивство Аркадія Бабченка. Ні президент, ні міністр внутрішніх справ, ні генпрокурор, ні голова СБУ, ніхто майже добу не коментував цю резонансну подію. Я ж про це все знав, а ніхто. Порошенко знав, а Гройсман не знав, а Порошенко знав. Пане Гройсмане, це поганий сигнал. Сьогодні ви не в курсі спецоперацій, а завтра будете боротись на руках з Литвином за місце в ефірі 112-го каналу. Страшне. Журналісти один плюс один зафільмували підсвідомість власника телеканалу Коломойського. Знятого відеоматеріалу вистачило на цілу телепрограму. Невигадана історія, як журналісти українських сенсацій побували на таємному спіритичному сеансі під Києвом. І ми знаємо, для яких двох відомих політиків влаштовують магічні дійства. Ось же телеканал «Один плюс один» лауреат 79 премій «Телетріумф» показав у програмі «Українські сенсації» типу розслідування про чорних магів та екзорцистів, послугами яких користуються українські політики. Беззаперечні докази того, що політика та магія завжди були поруч. Докази були настільки беззаперечними, що коли їх почали заперечувати, відео швиденько зникло з сайту телеканалу, з ютуб-каналу «Один плюс один» та з інших ресурсів, що транслювали передачу. Але завдяки знайомим магам та ворожкам. Ми воскресили його! З видалених. Щоправда, через декілька днів відео знову з'явилося на ютуб-каналі 1 плюс 1. Очевидно, це була спецоперація з Воскресіння. Ми на власні очі переконаємося в тому, що політики першої величини використовують таємні обряди для своєї влади. Початок інтригує. Про які обряди йде мова? Принесення в жертву НАБУ найменш рейтингового члена партії? Невигадана історія! Оскільки програма була знята прямо у підсвідомості Коломойського за допомогою окультних камер та магічних об'єктивів, то не дивно, що фігурували в ній політики та чиновники, на яких ображений сам власник телеканалу «Один плюс один» Ігор Коломойський. Під прискіпливим наглядом не перший рік – набожний Порошенко. Також в сюжеті йдеться і про Катерину Рожкову, заступницю голови НБУ, яка займалася націоналізацією «Приватбанку». В мережу потрапила переписка сьогоднішньої замглави Нацбанку Катерини Рожкової, в якій чиновниця начебто спілкується із ворожкою Оксаною. Начебто. Яка, як виявиться згодом, і впливає на рішення топ-чиновників. Начебто. Катя, смотрю, ситуація неспокійна. Думаю, 12 свічок потрібно ставити. Було повнолуніє. Спасибо. Здімальній групі українських сенсацій вдалося також вийти на справжню чорну магиню і навіть напроситися в гості на сатаринський ритуал. За кілька днів жінка сама телефонує нам і пояснює, сьогодні запланований важливий сеанс і один із тих потрібних п'яти учасників не зможе прийти. А інші зайняті. Ми їй дуже потрібні. Коли ви збираєтесь провести таємний ритуал, про який не потрібно знати широкому загалу, то кого треба на нього запросити? Правильно, журналістів з 1 плюс 1. Ці точно нікому не розкажуть. Нашого журналіста вивозять на таємний обряд в ліс. Оператор як зміг наблизився. Продирається крізь хащі, щоб об'єктив камери українських сенсацій зафільмував ледь не наймоторішніші кадри за існування програми. Програма телеканалу «Один плюс один українські сенсації» – не наче сатанинська біблія. Ми просто маємо повірити злу на слово. Жінка у чорному пальті. По колу четверо людей. У такому ж вбранні. В центрі кола та сама п'ятикутна зірка. П'ятикутна зірка? То, може, журналіста привезли на з'їзд Комуністичної партії України? Все сходиться. Зірка, комунізм, четверо людей, саме стільки залишилось партійців у КПУ, а в лісі – бо заборонені. Така пентограма в чорній магії – це символ сил пекла. 
мороз поза спиною. Але в центрі п'ятикутної зірки ми помічаємо фото відомих політиків. Так, стоп. Я терпляче дивився цей символ сил журналістського пекла. Але маю спитати, що це за ефект сіточки чи то маски бджуляра на об'єктиві камери? І чому він то з'являється, то зникає, то знову з'являється? І навіщо взагалі знімати крізь сіточку, якщо у вас прямо над місцем проведення ритуалу висить камера і навколо виставлене студійне світло? Ну, як це зазвичай і робиться на сатанинських месах. Ммм, сатаничненько. В це важко повірити, але на фото в центрі п'ятикутної зірки, над якою стоять темні маги, фото екс-нардепа Анатолія Гриценко та сьогоднішнього нардепа з ОПО-блоку Юрія Бойка. Чому на обряді присутня фотографія Бойка, питань не виникає. Ми давно підозрювали його у зв'язках з потаймічними силами. І я б навіть повірив у намагання Анатолія Гриценка зв'язати з чорною магією, якби він просив провести ритуал для вдалого кльову на риболовлі. Але... Просто зараз відбувається обряд з ціл енергетичного поля цих двох. На носі вибори не дивно. Так, на носі вибори. Але все одно дивно, що ще за 10 місяців до президентських виборів національний телеканал готовий вкидувати таку ядерну шизофазію про чорних магів, знято крізь шолом для фехтування. Видовище не для слабодухих. Від побаченого оператор випадково тупцює назад і ненароком стає на гілку, що роздає фатальний для нас звук. Дивно, що оператор не видав фатальний звук ще на стадії обговорення сценарію цієї маячні. Чи взагалі прийому на роботу у проєкт «Українські сенсації». Саме тоді треба було починати тупцювати назад. Нас викрито. Схоже, нас розкусили. Тільки не взялися з'ясовувати, як нас і тут викривають. Господи, яка маячня. Вони навіть придумати до кінця нічого не можуть. Їх навіть у власних вигадках викривають. За поясненнями, звичайно, ми звернулися й до тих, хто був в центрі Пентакля. Але, як завжди, почули політичні відмовки. І, мовляв, все, що ми бачили – Повна дурня. І за більш глибокою аналітикою ми звернулись за коментарем до чверть фіналістки 14-го сезону «Битви екстрасенсів» із журналістами українських сенсацій Ба 